I'm Amy Emmert, the Director of Education for the Belle Isle Conservancy, and I'd like to welcome you to the Belle Isle Aquarium, the nation's oldest aquarium, open in 1904. Come on inside. specialist here at the Bell Isle Aquarium and today we're going to investigate food chains and how energy moves through them. So where does all of our energy in our food chain start from? The Sun. Very good. Now the sunlight's energy goes down to the earth and gets converted into matter or food by our producers or our plants. If something comes along and eats that producer we call it our primary consumer. So what's so special about our primary consumers? Our primary consumers only eat plants, meaning that every primary consumer you come across is a, you guessed it, herbivore. And what comes next? Our secondary consumer. Very good. Now, our very special characteristic about our secondary consumer is that they are both predator and prey at the same time. Now, if something comes along and eats that secondary consumer, we call it a tertiary consumer. Everybody say ter, she, Air, re, tertiary. Very good. Now, what's unique about our tertiary consumers? Well, they are only predators. Now that we have an idea of what a food chain is, we're going to take a look at our driving question. Are there complete food chains in the aquarium tanks here at the Belle Isle Aquarium? Our investigation to whether there are complete food chains in the aquarium tanks or not, we must write, first write down our hypothesis on the worksheet here which is provided by a downloadable link in the description below. All right, so we're gonna be doing our hypothesis now. So where it says hypothesis, it says there blank complete food chains in the aquarium tanks because blank. In the first blank, I want you to either write that there are or are not. And you can also write a little short reason why. Okay, so in the chart below, check the boxes as you find that element of the food chain in the tank. So we will be visiting four separate tanks from different areas of the world and we're going to investigate, use our ob observations to either confirm or deny our hypothesis. All right scientists, it's time to start our investigation. First we're going to one of our African Great Lakes tanks. Come on, let's go! <laughs> Evidence of the sun? What about in the tank? You see any sun in there? We might not see sun in the tank, but if we look up at the ceiling, you'll notice a nice big skylight. That skylight is giving us that solar energy and putting it into our tank. Since we have evidence of the sun, go ahead and make a nice big check mark in that first box. Now, do we have any evidence of producers in here? Go ahead and take a closer look. Remember, scientists, producers take solar energy and convert it into matter. Take a close look on the rocks. Do you notice that fuzzy stuff on there? That's actually algae, an aquatic plant. Since we do have evidence of algae, which again is an aquatic producer, Go ahead and make a nice big check mark in that second box. Do 
Remember again that our primary consumers are something that eats our producers. Do we see any evidence of a primary consumer in here? Take a look at that squeaker there. Is it eating algae off the rocks? It is. So we have evidence of a primary consumer in our tank. Because of that, go ahead and make a nice big check mark on that primary consumer box. Now let's keep moving on. Do we have any evidence of secondary consumers in our tank? Again, take a closer look. Do we have anything in here eating our primary consumers? When we're looking for evidence in the tanks, we can also use information from up above. We have three different species in here. The Anchor Island Cichlid. We have the Featherfin Squeaker. And we have the Ruby Green Cichlid. While we're looking for secondary consumers, I want you to take a look at the size of the fish mouths. Do you think that one of these cichlids could fit that feather fin squeaker in here? Probably not. Their mouths are on the smaller side. So it would lead us to believe that we do not have any secondary consumers in here. And as you'll see right now, they're eating something called rapashi, which is a plant-based mix that has all the minerals they need in order to survive. But we still have one more box to go on our chart, the tertiary consumer box. Let's take a look at our tank again. Do you see any evidence of tertiary consumers in here? Or let me put it this way. Do you think any of these fish would eat each other? Probably not. So we'll leave that box blank for now. Great job on that first tank scientist. We'll visit Africa again in a little bit. But for now, it's time to head over to South America, to one of our Amazon River tanks. Okay, you all should be pretty adept at making some observations, so I'll give you some time to do so. may not all agree on the same thing, but that's okay. So if you see algae in here, you can go ahead and check it, and if you don't, well, you can leave it blank. Now, primary consumers, are there, is there anything eating the algae that may or may not be in this thing? Take a look at the Dorado's mouths. Now, they have very sharp teeth. Do you think that their teeth are for grinding up plants or for tearing up flesh? So let's step outside the tank. Now, all three of these species in here, the Dorado, the Silver Arowana, and the Freshwater Stingrays, are all secondary consumers. Now, what do you think their tertiary consumer might be? Would it be the bull shark? You may have guessed that. How about the cane? similar to an alligator. That's a good one. So, with all that being said, do you think that we would either keep a bull shark or a caiman inside this Amazon tank? Of course not. Amazing job in the Amazon! Now it's time to leave South America and travel north. Now we're at 
to take very near and dear to our hearts because it's one of our Great Lakes too. These are species native to the Great Lakes. We have our long nose gar, short nose gar, and our bowfin hiding down below. Let's get right to it. Do you see any evidence of the sun? It's still shining bright, so you've still got that. How about evidence of producers? Some nice plants in the background. Maybe even some algae on the rocks too. Now let's look for some primary consumers. Is there anything in here eating the algae or eating the plants? Make your observations. Remember to use your information above too. We learned from our information above that the gar like to eat fish and the bowfin likes to eat insects and crawdads. So it looks like we have some secondary consumers on our hands. So let's get back to our sheep. We definitely have evidence of the sun, so let's make a check mark there. We have evidence of producers, so let's make a check mark there. Unfortunately, we don't have any primary consumers, so we'll leave this box blank. We do also have secondary consumers, so we'll make a nice check there too. Let's take a second and look for tertiary consumers though. Do we see anything in here that could maybe eat something else in here? Again, let's take a look at their mouths. We've got a long nose guard here. It's got a pretty long mouth. And if you look closely, you can see some teeth in there too. However, also take a look at our short nose guard. It's got a little bit smaller mouth. And then lastly, our bowfin, which is just showing enough to let us take a look. It has a pretty small mouth. Do you think any of these mouths could eat another fish in here? Probably not. So we do not have any tertiary consumers in our tank. Now let's step outside of the tank and into our native Great Lakes region. What are some native tertiary consumers that we have? In the water, we've got some bigger fish, some musky, and some pike. And then outside the water, we've got some eagles, which like to swoop down and scoop up these fish. Almost done, scientists. One more tank to go. Let's head back to Africa, this time to the Congo River. This is our last tank. So you all should know how the process goes. So with that being said, Please take a few moments to fill out your field sheets, collect data, make your observations, help each other out. One second, Jim. up top and the information above is the fact that the tetra are in fact omnivorous, meaning that they can both eat plants and other living organisms. So on the Congo River tank, do we see evidence of a sun? Good. Do we see evidence of producers? Good. What about primary consumers? Do we see anything eating the algae or nibbling all the algae off the rocks? Good. What about secondary consumers? Tertiary consumers? So the umbu puffer fish has beak-like teeth in order to in order to crush shells, mollusks, and other shell-like organisms that live on the bottom of our freshwater systems. So, with that being said, 
it is a secondary consumer because it not only eats these living organisms, but it also puffs up as a defense mechanism to tertiary consumers. Yes, great job. You just investigated how energy from the sun gets converted into matter by producers and how consumers then move that energy through a food chain. Let's head back to where we started and wrap up. Now that we've explored our four tanks, we can come back to our driving question. Are there complete food chains in the aquarium tanks? Let's take a look at our shape. Now yours may look different from mine. This is what I came up with. We're missing our secondary and tertiary consumers in our African Great Lakes tank. In our Amazon tank, we're missing our primary consumer and tertiary consumer. Our North American Great Lakes tank is missing the primary consumer and the tertiary consumer as well. And then our last tank, the Congo River tank, we're missing that tertiary consumer, which would lead us to believe that there are not complete food chains in our aquarium tanks here at the Belle Isle Aquarium. However, there is a second part of our experiment that we're excited to show you. It's gonna talk about decomposers and answering, are decomposers an important end step in our food chain? Let's go into our eco lab and find out. <laughs> 